Thanks for sharing, Chi. The scope of AKS is very impressive. One of common goals for multi-tenant resource management is to increase utilization by sharing resources dynamically between different workloads. In next talk, Amit Bose will present how Uber increased utilization by co-locating mixed workload in the same cluster. Let's welcome Amit. Hello, everybody. This is Amit from Uber. Uh, and today I'll be talking about Project Morcor, which is our effort to co-locate different kinds of workloads on the Uber Compute platform. You've probably already heard about Uber. Uh, we started in 2010 as a ride-sharing platform with our black car service. And since then, we have moved on to other modes of transport. We are also transporting goods and uh, food, doing food delivery, grocery delivery, and much more. We operate at a big scale uh, in terms of the number of cities. We are in, operating in 10,000 cities across six continents, and we do more than 16 billion trips per day. Behind each of those trips and deliveries is a complex uh, network of stateless microservices which make that trip happen. These microservices do anything from matching a rider to a driver, projecting an ETA on when your car will arrive, to tracking your trip as it happens, uh, processing your payment, and much more. Uber has more than 3,500 microservices, which are dependent on each other in very complex ways. These microservices are very important to our business because any degradation in these services means that the end user has a bad experience on his or her mobile phone. Each of these trips actually generates a large amount of data. Things like mobile app events, uh, backend events, sensor telemetry. We have developed our own big data infrastructure so that we can make sense out of this data, so that we can build reports, we can drive business intelligence, and also guide machine learning. The result of these processes actually feeds back into how we handle trips, how we project demand, how we make pricing decisions, how we ensure rider safety, how we detect fraud. The use cases are simply endless. Let me now show you a little bit about the infrastructure that is powering these use cases. On the stateless uh, microservices side, we have all our applications which are containerized and they are running on Mesos. This is an open source cluster manager. We have built our own cluster scheduler, Peloton, on top of Mesos, and Peloton is the primary means by which microservices are managed and deployed at Uber. On the data analytics side, we use the Hadoop ecosystem. So all the data analytics jobs, the bad jobs, they are run on another popular open source cluster manager called Yarn. The thing to note here is that these two infrastructure stacks are completely independent. They operate in their own silos. And the goal of Project Morcor was about trying to converge these two different platforms onto a single one. You may ask, why are we doing this? Why do we need to do this convergence at all? To answer that question, I'm going to show you this graph from one of our clusters. It shows the CPU utilization of the cluster over a period of a few days. You will notice there are regular dips and rises, which roughly correspond to the increase in demand for rides that happens during the day and it falls during the night. But then there are also these unplanned spikes, things that we did not anticipate. But in this particular case, what had happened was one of our data centers had a networking problem. So all the trips had to be served out of a different data center and resulted in a spike in that other data center. When we size our microservices, we are actually preparing for this peak. What this means is that because there is a difference between the peak usage and the average usage, we are always have a lot of headroom in the normal case. How do we make use of this headroom, right? This is where the data analytical jobs come into picture. The idea is that let's try to run, utilize this unused headroom to run data jobs and thereby achieve cost savings. So our reason for doing 
co-location of these stateless jobs and bad jobs is essentially cost savings. We realize that we have unused capacity and we want to use that to run preemptible bad jobs which are short-lived. And in doing so, we can reduce the amount of hardware that is needed to run data analytics jobs and thereby bring about savings for the company. So Morker is the system that we have built for the co-location of stateless and uh, batch workloads, and it has been in production for over six months. We've rolled it out to over 90% of the fleet, and in this process, we've been able to extract more than hundreds, a few hundred thousands of cores for running bad jobs, uh, which are actually being used to run tens of thousands of bad jobs daily in our clusters. Before I go into the details of how co-location works at Uber, let me explain to you the, true, the two broad ways in which co-location can happen. One of them is called same host co-location. Here, what you do is you place the different kinds of jobs, stateless and batch, alongside on the same host. But bad jobs are very different in nature compared to stateless jobs. They are very resource intensive so we are always worried that they may harm the stateless jobs in some ways. Remember, our stateless jobs are serving rides and trips. So any degradation seen by those services directly affects the user experience for us. And we don't want that to happen. So to really co-locate stateless and bad jobs on the same host, we need to solve the problem of isolating these two jobs. Isolation, not only in terms of CPU, but also in terms of disk IO, network IO, memory bandwidth, cache access, and so forth. We believe that this is a hard problem and will take a long time to solve. So we explore another option, which we call same cluster co-location, where we are not placing the workloads on the same host, but they are on different hosts within the same cluster. This allows us to solve the isolation problem automatically and at the same time try to reap the benefits of co-location quicker. And that's why we have chosen to go with same cluster co-location. Let's dive a little deep into how same cluster co-location works at Uber. Say we start off with uh, a regular stateless cluster, which is running stateless microservices. The first thing that we do is enable overcommitment. So what does that mean? It means that every host st now starts advertising more CPU cores than it actually has in reality. This allows the scheduler to pack the previous set of microservices onto a fewer set of hosts and thereby frees up a couple of hosts. Next, we take the freed up hosts and mark them as batch hosts, whereas the runs that were running the stateless microservices, we tag them as stateless. Thus, we have formed a partition within the cluster, one for running bad jobs and the other for running stateless jobs. And finally, we bring in the bad jobs and run them on the batch partition, while the stateless jobs continue to run on the stateless partition. And thus, we have now achieved co-location of different workloads within our cluster. Creating partitions this way and overcommitment brings with it its own set of problems. I showed you before that our CPU utilization of the stateless microservices varies quite a bit and many a times unpredictably. How do we adjust the sizes of a partition so that we are always ahead of the game? How do we make sure that our services don't degrade because that will have ultimately a bad effect on what the user sees? Overcommitment actually makes the problem of resource contention worse. We have noticed in our clusters that some, the, the load is not distributed evenly, which means some hosts are running hotter than the others. With overcommitment, this problem becomes only worse because it can create local hotspots and thereby affect the services running on those hosts quite a bit. Again, this is not good for our microservices. In the subsequent slides, I'll be talking about how we have addressed both these problems. Let's look at the problem of resizing the partitions. The core idea is very straightforward. When the stateless partition starts becoming hot, uh, meaning, for example, when during the daytime, as the number of rides and deliveries are, is picking up, we need to replenish the capacity of the stateless partition so that we don't degrade any of your services. 
The converse actually happens at night. For example, when the demand for rides and services, rides and trips has gone down. At this point, we have excess capacity and some of it can be given over to the batch partition so that the batch jobs can continue running. Moving these hosts between partition is actually a non-trivial effort. Imagine the case where we are moving when the stateless partition is hot and we need to move some hosts from the batch partition. First thing is, when we move these hosts, we are actually going to be killing all the bad jobs that were running on those hosts. And this disrupts those, uh, those data analytics jobs that are running on them. Therefore, we need to be careful and we selectively pick those hosts on which things like the application master is not running so that the disruption is reduced. Once we pick a host, then we drain the workloads tag it back as a stateless, and then start populating stateless workloads on those hosts. For this, we rely on the natural service updates that are happening in the cluster all the time. And in addition, we also do a limited amount of rebalancing to spur the task of placing more workloads on these newly added hosts. The job of moving hosts from the stateless partition to the batch partition is actually even more trickier. So this happens when the stateless partition is cold and we can offer some hosts to the batch partition. Here again, we need to kill our stateless microservices, but remember, they affect our trips and deliveries. So we have to be careful in which services we are picking to kill. So we consider factors like the tier of the service, which is an indication of the relative importance of that service, we consider disruption budgets, we honor exclusion lists, and so forth. We do this process gradually so that not at any point in time, there are not too many instances of the stateless microservices which are being killed. And also we make changes to our placement strategy, again, with the same goal of reducing disruption. How do we decide whether a partition is hot or not, right? Because our decisions are based on whether the partition becomes hot, or when it becomes cold. To decide this, we are actually looking at the current cluster utilization in the cluster. And based on that, we predict what our peak needs will be. If we have sufficient capacity to satisfy that need, then we don't need to change anything in the cluster. But if it is not sufficient, then we need to expand the stateless cluster so that it has enough capacity to deal with a predicted peak. In the opposite case, like when the stateless partition is running cold, again, we are looking at what the predicted utilization will be. If we have more than enough capacity to satisfy the predicted capacity, it means that it is safe to move some of that capacity over to the batch partition. And this now triggers a shrinking of the batch partition. Now let's talk a little bit about the second problem that I mentioned before, the problem of resource contention. We've tried to mitigate this problem by using two techniques. The first one is called load aware placement, where we try to place services on hosts by considering the live load on the host. The idea is that if we can even out the load across the cluster, then the chances of resource contention or hotspots reduces. The second technique that we apply is through monitoring the live load on the host. If we notice that some hosts are running hot, then we try to proactively move some services out of that host onto possibly lighter loaded ones. This is again a disruptive process because we have to kill those microservices and move them over. So considerations like the tier, disruption budget, the exclusion list all come into play. Let me take you back to the infrastructure picture about, uh, about these stateless compute workloads and the data analytics workloads. I mentioned before, we have been able to free up hosts from the left-hand side in this picture, the compute stateless compute side through dynamic partitioning. But I haven't talked about how the data analytics workloads can actually use those freed up hosts. So next, we will be talking about how we can converge these two platforms and achieve co-location for our clusters. When we were thinking about this convergence part of it, we again had two options. The cluster scheduler on, on the stateless compute side 
which is Peloton, was actually designed with the mind of being able to support both stateless and batch workloads. So one option before us was to take all the batch workloads that are running on Yarn and migrate them over to Peloton. But at the scale at which Uber operates, migrations are hard and expensive. This is because there are challenges due, due to adoption of a new platform, there is impact to users, and there's a disruption of the ecosystem that people are used to. So we explored another option, which we call Yarn on Peloton, where the two main infrastructure components, Peloton and Yarn, cooperate together to make this happen. Essentially, Yarn is still manages and schedules the data workloads, but it is able to use the hosts that are coming from Peloton through dynamic partitioning. As a result, there is no migration and minimal user impact. This is why we've chosen to go with Yarn on Peloton. Let's look at the architecture of how the data stack and the compute stack fit together in this Yarn on Peloton model. The boxes in yellow are components of the compute stack, whereas the boxes in green are components of the Yarn stack. For Yarn on Peloton, the first thing that we do is take all the data jobs and containerize them. So they are able to run in Docker containers. Next, we also containerize this component called Node Manager. So Node Manager is a very important part of the Yarn system. It's the host agent, and it's ultimately responsible for running uh, batch workloads on a single host. By containerizing Node Manager and enabling it to use Docker, we are able to run batch workloads as Docker containers through a containerized Node Manager. The containerization of Node Manager is important because we ultimately want to package it as a stateless service. So the compute side is completely capable of running and managing stateless workloads. Now that Node Manager has become a stateless service, it can be deployed and managed on any compute host in the compute fleet. Let's look at how the interaction between Peloton and Yarn goes as far as this exchange of hosts happens. When the compute side has freed up hosts through dynamic partitioning, it advertises this to Yarn. Yarn then turns around and says, okay, great. It asks Peloton to start running these node manager stateless services on these hosts. Peloton does that, and as the node manager instances come up, they register themselves with the Yarn system. At this point, this host is effectively part of the Yarn cluster. Whenever Yarn needs to run jobs, the Yarn scheduler then reaches out to this node manager and asks it to run the jobs. And the node manager is able to do that by talking to the local Docker daemon and managing the complete lifecycle of those jobs. What happens when Peloton wants to take the host back? Let's look at that interaction now. So if the stateless partition is under pressure, then Peloton might want to take some of the hosts it gave to Yarn back. At this point, Yarn responds back to Peloton with an ordered list of hosts. This ordered list of hosts gives Peloton a chance to pick hosts in an order that has been decided by Yarn. Peloton then goes ahead and starts signaling the node manager container running on these hosts so that they can do the cleanups that are necessary before the hosts can be reclaimed back. So the node manager kills all the bad jobs running on them, it cleans up the disk state, it unregisters the node from Yarn, and finally, it gets stopped by Peloton. As a final step, Peloton then goes ahead and does a second round of cleanup on the host, whereby it basically kills off any stale containers that might be left behind or any other state on the disk that was not cleaned up by Node Manager. And now the, the reclamation of the host is complete. So let me recap what we've been talking about so far. At Uber, we are doing co-location because we want to save costs on hardware. We realize we have unutilized headroom and we want to utilize that headroom to run bad jobs. The way we do this is by creating virtual partitions within the cluster, one for stateless workloads and one for batch, and we adjust these partitions in response to live load. The way our infrastructure of data analytics can use these freed up hosts is a unique collaboration between the compute platform and the data platform. 
which allowed us to make use of the host without having to migrate users to a new platform. I mentioned before that the system has been in production for a while. And along the way, we have actually learned a few things. First and foremost, we have to minimize disruption because disruption means a degradation in the experience of our end users, be it uh, the mobile users, riders and drivers, or internal users who have been using the data analytics platform. Yarn and Peloton, they are complex systems by themselves, and a good integration between them needs to have well-defined, clear contracts and as minimal dependencies between them. This ensures that the systems can stay loosely coupled but at the same time, resilient and reliable. And finally, this co-location effort was needed coordination between two different organizations. And solving these organizational alignment issues were as important as solving the technical problems themselves. Looking ahead, we want to keep working on the code algorithms within dynamic partitioning so that we can tap into the unutilized headroom better. In addition, we also want to explore integrations with other systems just like YARN. We, we believe that systems for machine learning or CI-CD systems can also benefit from the host that can, can get freed from the compute platform through dynamic partitioning. Thank you all for listening to this talk about uh, Morcor. Uh, you can find other interesting projects that people are working on at Uber on our engineering blog. Thank you.